you have type 2 narcolepsy. Yes, professor. Please tell us about type 2 narcolepsy. What the heck is type 2 narcolepsy? So type 2 narcolepsy, we actually understand a lot less about than type 1 narcolepsy. Type 2 narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia, another hypersomnia disorder, seem to have a decent amount of overlap. Essentially, there are some significant key symptoms for um, narcolepsy, there's excessive daytime sleepiness. Anyone with a hypersomnia disorder will have that. And then you may have a sprinkling of other uh, symptoms like disruptive dreams or maybe even hearing or seeing things that aren't there as you're falling asleep or waking up. I know I experienced some of those hallucinations. I would have to call my neighbor to come over in residency <laughs> to make sure no one was in the house. That was um, interesting. There's a sleep paralysis, which can happen, you know, in the general population as well and for other sleep disorders, but where you wake up and you feel like you can't move your body or as you're falling asleep and it can be terrifying um, and you're kind of in between the sleep and wake state. In type 1 narcolepsy, which is not what I experience, but with strong emotions, you may lose a muscle tone, usually positive emotions for a couple minutes. You're still awake, but that can be um, a, a confusing symptom for many uh, uh, clinicians and uh, patients alike. An another symptom that is coming out more in the forefront more recently, and they talked a lot about at the sleep meeting, is brain fog, which is something that um, I experienced um, and I do experience uh, as someone with narcolepsy. It, we all thought about sleepiness, 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 but this brain fog where maybe you're having these word finding difficulties or you're just having trouble processing things is another big symptom. Um, and it's a chronic neurological disorder, meaning there's not a cure for it yet. There's lots of treatments um, and something happening in the brain. I love that. I'm gonna add one more symptom that sometimes we don't think about, which mm -hmm. is disrupted nighttime. Sleep. Yes, thank you for bringing so, that up. Yeah, so sometimes patients people may come across more like, well, their sleep is really not that great. They seem to be waking up a lot or they're just aware that their sleep is not great. And that was something that was a rude awakening for me to even think about for my patients like, shoot, I've had patients that are sleepy. Like, did I miss this window of opportunity? You think back and you go, should I have done that case differently or behave differently? So every discussion that we have not only helps teach the general public, but also gets sleep doctors more comfortable with stuff that's even kind of challenging for us to make that diagnosis. Speaking of these specific symptoms, now you mentioned the hallucinations and you mentioned the brain fog. When did all of this start happening? How did you even get to the point of realizing that there was a true sleep disorder that you were needing, that you were essentially living with? Yes, it was certainly a surprise when I got the diagnosis. In, um, middle school and high school, I was always the one that could uh, sleep really, really well anywhere, anytime. And our um, van trips, I remember we drove up to uh, Washington, D.C., and I was able to sleep on and off most of that trip when everybody was awake. Um, and I had these really, really vivid dreams that most of the time people don't want to hear about your dreams, but people wanted to hear about mine because they were <laughs> just so wild. So it started in my early teens, um, but I was still able to like function, push through, didn't really think there was ever an issue. In college, same thing, was able to push through um, but would often fall asleep in the middle of the afternoon when we're watching a movie, different things. When I got to medical school and started doing my rotations, my sleep was a little more restricted. And at the same time, I got a upper respiratory infection when I was on my pediatrics rotation. And sounds about right. Yeah, there's little it's a right lights called children, right? right? There's just the right nonstop boogers. Yeah. And after that, my symptoms got a lot worse. I was coming home and taking two, three hour naps and then eating dinner, trying to study a little bit, sleeping the whole night through and just having a lot of time retaining information, staying awake uh, during my rotations. I was just trying to push through. I figured it was just, you know, this is medical school. This is hard. Um, and I got to my family medicine residency, which had more reasonable hours. And my preceptor pulled me aside and asked me if I was really serious about medicine because I, it didn't seem like I was studying. It didn't seem like I was putting forth as much of an effort, which was devastating to me because I cared so, so much. But it was also a wake up call that, okay, this is not me. There might be something going on medically. So I went through a similar 
I've heard other patients talk about this, you know, is it depression, right? A lot of medical students are depressed. Mm -hmm. So let's treat that and see. And, you know, it is depressing when you feel like you're not doing well and there's a lot of overlap. But I got to the point where I came back to my doctor and I said, you know, I don't really feel depressed. I just feel sleepy and I'm kind of desperate. I'm not doing well on my exams. Can I just try a stimulant? And my doctor said, yeah, we can try this, but if you, if you continue to need it or it helps we ha have you see psychiatry or sleep. And I was like, sleep medicine, that's a discipline. I had zero clue. I know, isn't that nuts? We're not, I'm like, what the heck is sleep medicine? I didn't even know that was a thing. Exactly, no idea. Still, like, narcolepsy is not on my radar at all. We, I remember um, on my preclinical years in medical school that I watched a video of this cute little dachshund with narcolepsy and Rusty, so sweet, and he just kind of is trotting around and then kind of falls over. That's all I learned about narcolepsy. And narcolepsy, like you, you mentioned, Mr. Bean, I mean, I just assume like people just fall asleep at the drop of a hat. So still was not like even a thought for me. And I um, made it to the sleep center, uh, Dr. Rich Berry, who I love dearly. Um, he's such a sweet, wonderful physician, but he, um, he said, hey, I don't really think you have sleep apnea, but let's do this testing for hypersomnia disorders. And then in the fall of my fourth year of medical school, I got my diagnosis. He called me. You were diagnosed by the Dr. Richard Berry. Yes. Guys, this guy's like a freaking icon. Okay? He is this is nuts. A legend and wow. so down to earth and wonderful and incredible. So um, I owe so much to him for helping me through that time and um, my time through residency too. He's just an incredible person. I want to pause for a second and just, if anybody is listening again, medical students, I, you know, there's so much stuff on Google, there's AI, there's even questions amongst us as physicians, like, dude, what are we spending all this time in school, knowledge, like feeling sometimes even replaceable in our current healthcare model. I think it just needs to be said, if you think about the path to where we took in the United States, you're looking at four years of an undergrad, and then you have four years of medical school. NC is just another kind of leap forward, and then there's fellowship training, whatever that may be, if that's what you choose to do. Those steps, you're looking like at eight years just to get to the point of residency and to feel as though you go through all of those steps and you're not good at medicine to have your residency instructor basically kind of flag that you know like what's your deal are you serious and really you're just trying to manage with a, a sleep disorder that hits home so so much so even if you don't even know what the heck is going on the fact that you spoke up that you mentioned the word sleepy by the way how we talk to people especially physicians when we get so little training during our um our medical school and even our residency training about sleep it is the most de-emphasized thing we can do for ourselves even none of that stuff is emphasized at all it's like no 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 it's the culture of like work harder sleep less and you mentioned it i didn't have the opportunity to get as much rest that's like you know a badge of honor almost I right. mean, think about like, thank God you weren't trying to go into surgery. Oy vey. <laughs> I can say there, it'd be up at like 5 a.m. and you work for 18 hours and you better not be tired by the end of that. I mean, that would have been very, very challenging.